The Old Testament reading for Ash Wednesday is from Joel chapter 2. Yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, but the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is, your God, where, where is their God? Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me. For in you my soul takes refuge. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. The epistle is from 2 Peter chapter 1. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be rightly, uh, richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Do not remember against us our former iniquities. Let your compassion come speedily to meet us. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the first chapter. Glory to you, Lord. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man, 
who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. In the name of Jesus. How many of you are willing to admit you have a tattoo in public? Raise your hand. A few of you? I almost got a tattoo in college once, but that was around the time, right after 9-11, when gas prices were higher than they are now. And as a poor college student, I thought, nope, gas is more important than a tattoo. So I didn't get one. But tattoo parlors really need to have over the entrance of their stores a sign that says, think before you ink. And then they should place a recording on repeat in their building that says, do you really want to have your girlfriend's name on your shoulder the rest of your life? Because tattoos are expensive to get removed. More and more people who have tattoos are experiencing what's called tattoo regret syndrome. And according to a 2018 Harris poll, the number of Americans with tattoos and those considering tattoo removal is on the rise. But again, it's not cheap. And it's not easy. To remove a single tattoo can take up to 12 sessions, and that's spaced out over the course of two years. And each session can cost between $100 and $400 a pop. But if your regrets and your life were to show up on you as tattoos, how marked up would you be? What pictures would show up? Whose faces would appear? How much money will appear that you've wasted? How many times that you said the phrase, I wish I would have, would show up as well? So dig around in the basement of your life for a moment with me. And what are you going to what are you going to find there? You're going to find wasted time and years even, obsessive greed, destructive diversions, anger, arrogance, selfishness. What are you going to do with all these new marks, all these new tattoos that you can't get rid of? Well, first you could try and be defensive to one extreme. And when we're defensive, we don't admit anything. We tell no one. We keep that skeleton safely locked away in the closet where no one can find it. And we seek our innocence and not forgiveness, no. And when we're defensive, we reduce our life to one goal, keep the secret hidden. Cover it up. Don't address it. Don't admit it. And whatever you do, never confess it. That's one extreme, defensive. And when we see the marks of regret in the basement of our life, the other option is to be defeated. And when we're defeated, we feel as though we don't just make mistakes, we feel that we are the mistake. We didn't just mess up, we are the mess up. And so we beat ourselves up continually with blame. And we take the role of judge, jury, and accusing attorney on ourselves, and the verdict is always guilty. 
Defensive people hide the marks. Defeated people replan. So there's got to be a better way between these two extremes. Defensive or defeated. What we need is to be delivered from those marks. So what does God say? What does he say when we're defensive about our sin? What does he say when we're defeated by our sin? He says, behold, the Lamb of God who carries away the sin of the world. When it comes to all our ugly marks of sins, we can be delivered. First John says, behold, literally means to see. That verb can be translated as look or gaze or stare or take note. I remember Dr. Gieschen even translating it as looky here. But it can also mean here's the whole point of what I'm saying. When you come across the word behold in the New Testament, especially in the Gospels, pay attention. John the Baptist says it twice. In John 1.29 and again in 1.36. Behold. Look. Gaze. Stare. Take note. Here's the point of what I'm saying. Behold the Lamb of God. And it's no ordinary Lamb that Jesus is pointing people towards. He's pointing them to the Passover Lamb of God. St. John the Evangelist, the writer of the Gospel, not John the Baptist, St. John the Evangelist uses the word Passover 11 times in his Gospel. 11! He structures his entire Gospel so that you can see, behold, look at, gaze upon, take note of, the Christ. The Passover Lamb of God. And what's the Passover lamb of God? Well, let's look back at Exodus real quick. Exodus 12, Moses tells us that the Passover lamb is to be a male lamb, perfect, spotless, and without defect. And Exodus 12, verse 7, says that the Israelites are to place the Passover lamb's blood on the sides and the tops of their door frames. And that this blood from the Passover lamb of God would set the Israelites free. Free from the bricks, free from the whips, and free from Pharaoh's tyranny and captivity and slavery. Behold, look, gaze, stare, take note. Here's the whole point of what I'm saying. The Lamb of God who carries away. Normally we hear this translated as, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away, which isn't wrong. But the Greek gets a little bit more simple. It's the Greek word Pharaoh. Not Pharaoh as in the king of Egypt, but Pharaoh that means to carry. And this verb that John the Baptist uses, carries away, is present tense. And that means that Christ still carries away. Today, he carries away. Tomorrow, he carries away. Next week, he carries away. Next year, he carries away. And he's carrying away the sins of the world. And that includes yours. All your ugly sin, your shameful sin, your taunting and haunting sins. Every single one. He carries it all away. He carries away your guilt. That's the sins that you do. The sins done by you. But he also takes away the shame. That's the sins done to us. Guilt is what we feel when we've done wrong. 
Shame is what we feel when someone has wronged us. I remember in college, my beloved professor, Dr. Stolman, may he rest in peace, told us that we Lutherans are really good at dealing with guilt, but we're really bad at dealing with shame. So let's deal with it. We all know what public shame is. Maybe you've been branded by a divorce or marked with a handicap. Maybe you've been saddled with an alcoholic parent. Or maybe you've been crushed because of a child's arrest. Or maybe you're stig stigmatized because you lost your job and you can't provide for your family anymore. Or you lost your spouse and you don't know what to do. You lost your home. You lost your life savings. Everybody knows. And how do you feel? That's public shame. But there's also private shame. And every one of us here has felt that too. You've been pushed to the edge by an abusive spouse. Or you were molested by a perverted parent, seduced by a sneaky superior, or teased without mercy by the other kids at school. And no one knows. Nobody knows, except you. And it's enough to bury you. That's shame. Whether it's guilt or shame, what do you do about it? Do you put your hands over your ears? Do you splash water in your face, go for a long drive or a walk in the park? Nothing's going to take away your shame. Nothing's going to take away your guilt. Nothing you do anyway. Because sin has you marked. Sin has you marked and that's the end of the story. No, it's not. Sin is never the end of the story. You don't have to drink away your sins. You don't have to work away your sins, explain them away, eat them away, cry them away, or bury them away. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Most of us have carried around those ugly marks of sin, of that guilt and that shame for so long that we can't even imagine life without it. Well, maybe we can't imagine it, but God can. Jesus can. And he does it more than just imagine your life without that guilt and that shame. He sends John the Baptist to tell you, Behold, look, gaze. Here's the point of what I'm trying to say. The Lamb of God. Who carries away the sins of the world. The Passover Lamb of God does it all. For the whole world. The Passover Lamb of God does it all for you. Lent's a great time for you to get into the habit and to cultivate the habit of going to private confession. Because in private confession, you can tell Jesus what you did. You can tell Jesus what happened to you. And you can be absolved by your pastor. 
The pastor and I stand ready to hear your confession and to pronounce absolution upon you. For in private confession, you can tell Jesus what you said, what you saw, what you took, and how you feel. Tell Jesus. Hold nothing back. There's no guilt that's too old or too recent. There's no shame that's too evil or too insignificant. None of those ugly marks are so malicious that they can't be completely removed by the absolution. I forgive you all your sins. Sometimes we're tempted to say, Jesus, take it all away. I'm such a loser. But that doesn't work. Because for one thing, you're not a loser. What you are is a baptized, loved child of God. And for another... Those ugly marks are only removed when they're exposed to the grace of Jesus. But what do you need grace for? Because you're a bad person? Well, yeah, but that's too general. For losing your patience at a meeting and calling your coworker a jerk? Yeah, confess that. Confession is not punishment for sin. Confession names the sin so that it cannot hold you captive to guilt and shame. Confession names the sin so it can be exposed to the grace of God and be removed entirely. So we don't need to be defensive. We don't need to be defeated. In Jesus, we are delivered. And we do that by looking at the marks of God, at the marks on the hands of Jesus. Behold, look, see, gaze. Here's the point of what I'm saying. I have engraved you on the palms of my hands, God says in Isaiah. Jesus has your name written where he can see it. Your name is engraved on his nail-pierced, blood-stained hands. And that is amazing. So how does God react when guilt and shame have you cornered? When you're ready to be swallowed up? How does God feel when you're lost and abandoned and when you feel helpless? Well, if you've ever wondered about that or if you've ever wondered what would God do if he ever saw what I did, which he does, And frame these words. Hang them on your wall. Put them on the dashboard of your car. Behold, the Lamb of God who carries away the sin of the world. Trust those words. Believe those words. Stand below those words. Trust Jesus in those words to carry it all away. For carried it all, he did all the guilt, all the shame to the cross. On a God-forsaken cross, Jesus there takes the nails. And Jesus 
still says, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. And in the end, these are the only marks that matter. The marks on the hands of Christ. For those marks will never, ever be removed. In the name of Jesus, amen. The peace of God which surpasses understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, amen.